I'm delighted to welcome um, Catherine uh, Braddock. Uh, Catherine is Director General Financial Services at Her Majesty's Treasury in the UK. Uh, Catherine, on behalf of everyone, uh, I'd like to thank you for spending some time with us today. It's a pleasure. Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, the topic of Brexit and the EU's future relationship with the UK and financial services is very emotive, as you're fully aware. And one where, from an industry perspective, both sides somehow really need to try and find a way for a period of stability so, so the industry can find a way to serve their clients in, in the best possible means, um, particularly in the circumstances of the, the pandemic and the support for the wider economy. And, and this won't be easy for many reasons, one of which itself is that Brexit is not really an event, it's a process. So mm -hmm. perhaps, Catherine, I can start by asking you a couple of questions and then I'll actually throw it open to people for, 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 for um, Q&A functions. And I'll do my best to, to, to ask as many questions um, that are relevant as possible. But perhaps I can start with, you know, the UK started this new chapter in its history um, from the start of the year. And in financial services, what, what's the plan? Um, well, as you've indicated, Daniel, clearly we need to close out the outstanding questions in, our, um, in the structure of our relationship with the European Union. And an immediate focus, as many on this call will know, is um, that we, with the European Commission, need to put in place a memorandum of understanding. And that will explain how we intend to structure and organise our regulatory dialogue. Um, so I think in terms of um, our relationship with the EU, that's going to be um, an early focus. Of course, we've never made any secret of the fact that our goal would be that we establish a sort of steady state relationship with the European Union based on mutual findings of equivalence. And um, I would hope that we can make progress towards that in the course of this year. But that's not, of course, um, within our control. Um, but I think it's clear that we need to move on from a period that I think the industry has regarded as a period of hiatus in public policy around financial services since the um, European Union referendum. Um, we need to answer the sort of forward-looking strategic questions arising from our departure from the EU, but also address what has changed in the sector in the sector itself in the last four or five years. You know, how are we going to engage with other jurisdictions around the world? How are we going to use our access tools? What are critically, what um, are the priorities and values of the UK's public authorities with regard to the stability of the system and the efficiency with which it serves our economy? Um, I think centrally, what kind of environment is the UK going to be for financial services businesses? And there, of course, of course, um, our goal will continue to be that we want to be a world leading financial centre. We want to have a financial services sector that serves the needs of our economy, um, including through its stability and transparency, as well as through its competitiveness. Um, the Chancellor gave a speech in November, actually, in the House of Commons that um, gave an it was intended to give a kind of indication of our um, forward direction on financial services policy. And in that speech, he focused on three themes, openness, um, on technology and on the imperative that financial services um, becomes part of the effort to um, address climate change. Um, and those are, of course, the areas where we also see tremendous innovation in the industry. So you can expect that those will continue to be our themes and priorities as we move forward. Just in the sense, in the immediate sense of, you know, what's on my desk and what are we focusing on at the Treasury? We are, um, uh, we're actually in the in the process, in a sort of creative phase of, on quite a lot of policy. We're waiting for um, the output of Ron Khalifa's FinTech review, which many on this call will have engaged with. Um, we're waiting for Lord Hill's uh, listings review, which again, um, I, I know he's spoken to many people in the industry, including many on this call. Um, we're concluding first uh, consultation on our future regulatory framework, a consultation on crypto assets and on the operation of the um, OPE. And we're working on a green guilt. So you can see that we're in a period of tremendous sort of creativity and activity um, before, before it feels as though some things will start to progress and indeed to change. Thank you. And, and, and in relation to um, COVID-19, the European side, there's been a raft of regulatory um, measures, support measures, um, trying to mitigate the impact, both both on financial services, but, but also the wider economy. How's the UK been supporting the, the industry through the pandemic? 
Well, we um, we in particular, um, of course, uh, kept uh, we're very interested in the the Mifid Quick Fix package, which um, by and large we are also pursuing here, or, or something pretty similar. Um, in fact, of course, our, our focus last year, all of us at the Treasury last year, were um, forensically focused on the need to support the UK's economy. And I think the most important thing we did for the financial services sector in the last year was um, protect the UK economy from the most severe effects of the public health crisis. Um, now, the, the main the main um, measure there, I think, and the one that, that people talk most about is all the measures we had to support um, employment and to support salaries. And that's because by um, supporting employment as far as possible, we limit long term scarring to the UK's economy. Um, the financial services industry, in fact, has been, of course, instrumental in um, supporting businesses and households, both through support to, um, in, to, to individuals in managing their personal finances through the uncertainty, but also through the um, quite a variety of lending schemes that, that we launched in the course of last year, some of which were really uh, entirely novel for the, for the UK. Um, and also on the insurance side, through the provision of various kinds of insurances and, and critically, of course, um, trade credit insurance. So, um, and, uh, you know, in doing so, that, that was that it was pretty challenging to to intervene to, to that extent in financial services markets. It's something that um, is very rare in the UK for us to do. Um, and I think we were very fortunate to have a really engaged, really serious and very agile conversation with the industry as we went through that, frankly, completely unexpected and very severe shock. Thank you. L last week, um the trading of Swiss equities uh, occurred in London um, following the equivalence arrangement that the UK struck with Switzerland. How important are such equivalence decisions with third countries, if I use the, the uh, EU um, terminology, to maintain the competitiveness of the uh, UK? Well, um, we've been devoting, as you can imagine, an enormous amount of time to this, um, concluding agreements with Japan and Singapore uh, towards the end of last year and now with announcements around CPTPP and um, dialogues coming up this year, we hope, with um, India and China and possibly Brazil. Um, clearly, the question of um, the means by which we can assure safe access and um, trade with like-minded jurisdictions on financial services is one of the key areas where we expect a lot of focus and where ministers have a lot of ambition. Um, I think a really interesting example is actually the mutual recognition agreement we're working on with the Swiss, which is the most ambitious um, agreement, most no in a, a very novel agreement um, that like-minded jurisdictions have ever tried to achieve on financial services. I think the extent to which it is as you say, equivalence in the in the legal European sense, and the extent to which um, we use different tools, is one of the things that we're going to be exploring in the course of this year. And in fact, you know, the reason we were consulting on the OPE is that we think we need to be clearer with industry and with our third country partners about how we understand the different uses of these tools and how we might want to deploy them in relationships that that differ very considerably, actually, in terms of which sectors they focus on, the maturity of the engagement and um, the sort of goals that we have. So I think it's uh, I think that's quite a rapidly developing area of policy. And it will be really interesting in the course of this year to see, you know, the, how we how we fill out the answer to those questions. Thank you. On, on, on the flip side, if I take the opposite of the, um, the, the um, Swiss trading, we've seen the migration of equities um, post um, the uh, beginning of this year, largely to Amsterdam in the EU, um, due to the EU STO requirements. Um, and derivatives trading has largely shifted to New York because of the EU DTO requirements. Um, and for anyone who hasn't seen it, I would highly recommend some analysis by Kirsten Winters, IHS market, the looking at the DTO um, um, requirements and the implications on the markets this year. So, so that aside, Catherine, um, have, have these changes been foreseen? Is there anything that surprised you or your colleagues? Well, yeah, I mean, in the sense that these decisions came quite late, no, they weren't foreseen. I think we, um, th this isn't where we wanted to end up, frankly, on either derivatives trading or, or share trading. And 
So um, it, it ran pretty late in the day, those sets of decisions. But once um, it was clear what they were going to be, I think it, it was also reasonably clear the nature of the impact it was going to have. I mean, I, our position is broadly it's a negative impact for, for Europe as a geography because fragmentation is negative for the operation of efficient financial yeah. services and ultimately it's it's real economy businesses that pay. Um, we'll have to see how that develops um, and uh, you know we will continue to focus on working out how we can how we can be an open financial center and how we can secure sort of concentration of liquidity as far as we sensibly can in the UK. Okay, thank you. Um, the the UK and the uh, Commission sat down last year to to try and hammer out a sort of a future arrangements um, uh, under the the Trade and Cooperative Agreement, uh, the, the mm. uh, TCA. Um, but but despite sort of best endeavours to to achieve equivalence, um, if I look about how many equivalence arrangements the EU's granted to the UK, it's one more than Albania. And the same as Taiwan and Thailand. So, do, do, do you really think that the industry, because this is what the industry wants, mm. you know, can expect positive uh, equivalence decisions on the back of the MOU discussions? I think, I mean, I think it's important to be clear what the MOU will do. It's not, it's an administrative tool, it's not a policy tool, it's not a means by which we can rerun or. Um, uh, kind of work around the uh, the TCA that we concluded on Christmas Eve. The purpose of the MOU is for it to be clear that, that for the terms of our engagement to be clear, and I think for industry to be clear that we can engage with each other in a structured, organised, and essentially constructive way. Um, we would like uh, we would like to be able to, in some way, structure the fact that we are going to have to have conversations that bear on equivalence between the two of us. Um, the fewer equivalence decisions there are, bluntly, the less we will have to have that conversation. And as I say, that's not something largely within our control in the UK. Um, our approach to equivalence decisions in the course of last year was to do the work and to make the, the decisions that we felt we could on the basis of the information we had about the way the relationship was going to operate. But um, the extent to which that is um, enhanced in the course of this year by, by further decisions is not dependent on the EU and isn't really within the control of the UK. That's very much for um, the European Commission uh, to engaging with member states and with their supervisors and within their own um, policy agenda. So from a UK perspective, what does success look like in terms of the MOU that, that will hopefully be agreed? Uh... So I think, yeah, it, that's a, it's a good question. And I, I'm reluctant to say an enormous amount about it because I think that's a conversation that we need to be having with the Commission in the first instance. So if you'll forgive me if I don't get into lots of detail, but I think... Okay. Um, you know, the, the sorts of relationships that we're looking at, we have a very constructive and engaged uh, relationship with the US through the um, Financial Regulation Working Group. Um, we Both we and the European Union have um, FTAs with Japan that set out arrangements for, for um, regulatory dialogue. And I think what we want is, a, is an MOU that makes clear what, what we're going to talk about, why we're going to be talking about it, the frequency with which we discuss those issues and set some expectations around um, transparency and how we intend to go about the discussion. I hope, I mean, we, we've set a goal that we'll we'll do this um, by March. Um, we've been careful not to say whether that's the beginning or the end of March, but my hope is that you won't have to wait too much longer to see what's involved in that MOU. And then I think we just need to actually get on with establishing the new normal in the relationship and moving on. So do, are there any differences that you think between the discussions last year or the discussions you know, now or the run up to the end of March? Well, I think, I mean, as I say, the, this this conversation about the MOU is primarily administrative. It's about how we engage with each other. So it's mm -hmm. not intended to um, deliver sort of a new policy outcome or um, substantially alter the nature of the relationship. The EU has its own legislative um, structure for the mm -hmm. way it engages with third countries. And now so do we. So I don't think it's about altering that um, so much. Mm -hmm. And in that respect, therefore, I think it's a much simpler 
it's a much simpler conversation and of course mm -hmm. it doesn't it's not connected with with a sort of much wider and vastly more mm -hmm. complex political process mm -hmm. okay thank you um if, if i can move on slightly and, and actually if if um just remind people if they want to um ask questions pl please put them L last week the treasury announced it was joining the international platform on sustainable mm. finance co-managed by the european commission which, which i must say is very welcome i, I know mm. that's in line with the tca on climate change but i wonder mm. if you can share a few words on the rationale behind the decision yeah well we have um a really comprehensive agenda on um, greening financial systems and mobilizing finance and financial services to support resilient growth, to support the transition to a net zero economy here in the UK and in support of the aims of COP26. And indeed, it's very important to us in COP26. It's one of the contributions we think we can make that we can integrate finance much more closely into the COP agenda, not just for this uh, COP, but but on a permanent basis. So um, our, our intention is to contribute to the, to the um, forum's goals um, in respect of scaling up mobilization of private capital towards sustainable finance um, and to promote integrated markets for environmentally sustainable finance. And I think, um, so, I mean, the first thing to say, perhaps, and I should have said it at the start, is this is an excellent example of where we in the European Union have a shared agenda, very much shared priorities and imperatives, and um, we'll want to work together constructively to secure these goals, um, looking forward and not in the rearview mirror. Um, from the UK perspective, I think we feel very strongly that it's important to be at the vanguard of the effort to ensure convergence around standards, culture, practices, and market infrastructure to support um, the greening of the financial system and the integration of finance into this agenda. Um, because we cannot possibly achieve these goals if we try to do that financial work on a kind of balkanized domestic basis. We're going to have to create um, shared international expectations, cultures and structures to ensure effective allocation of capital internationally and um, really genuinely deep pools of liquidity to allocate to those goals. So um, I think, I mean, it wasn't, it was, it, it was a no brainer, frankly, um, that this was going to be part of our agenda in the future. Okay, thank you. Um, the, 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 the um, uh, if I can just bring in um, Nick to it, there's been some, well, some questions started to be asked, but if I could just ask my colleague, um, Nick, uh, just to ask a question or two. So thanks, Catherine, for doing this. Really appreciate it. I think maybe two questions. I think one is on international standard setting. I mean, it'd be interesting, the international standards have always set the floor for international cooperation, and I think also the floor for equivalence decisions. How do you see the, A, the UK's role in international standard setting bodies going forward as a unique partner, but also the cooperation with the EU in the future and bodies like Basel, IOSCO, and so on? And that's why yeah. maybe I start with that one. Okay. Um, so I think in some respects, you won't see much change because um, we will continue to want to be very active and influential in the international standard setters. We have a very uh, large and complex financial system here in the UK. For that to be safe for our economy, it needs to operate within an international system of shared standards and expectations. And so it's a matter of certain kind of um, uh, economic imperative for us to be present um, in that environment and present and influential in that environment. I think we also feel um, that we uh, bring value to those discussions. That's certainly our aspiration. Um, we at the Treasury are involved. I'm on the Financial Stability Board, but of course our regulators, the FCA, the PRA and the Bank of England are heavily involved um, at the technical level across all the international standard setters to contribute to and learn from really informed um, leading edge international debate. So in a sense, I don't see um, I don't see a change, to be perfectly honest. I think it's a story of continuity. Um, where the European Union is concerned, we, of course, I mean, our rule book still is extensively the European Union rule book. And we worked, you know, 
very hard when we were members of the European Union to influence that rule book. We don't reject it. We don't think it's terrible. Um, we worked hard to influence it because we think it's a, you know, very, very much of it, the vast majority of it is beneficial um, for the UK and because not least because it reflects those international standards. So I would hope to see not an, not an enormous change and I would hope to see a sort of continuation of, of uh, in very many areas, a shared philosophy with the European Union about international standards. Thank you. Maybe one follow-up question, a slightly different one. The beloved term of open strategic autonomy, you know, it started off under Juncker, so when the UK was still firmly a member of the European Union, but it's often being read in the last year or two as kind of being a response to Brexit. Hmm. How, and, and then we got this communication two weeks or so ago that very hmm. much focused on economic and financial issues and strategic autonomy. How, how do you view this uh, as, uh, you know, how does that impact, you think, in the short term, the, the way you cooperate and the possible negotiations around the MOU? I think, um, so, I mean, the first thing to say is that the United Kingdom leaving the single market in financial services really substantially alters that single market. Um, it means that there isn't this really very large international financial centre that has to be taken account of in the way that um, rules and standards are written and the way policy is made, That which is not to say that, that uh, there aren't very significant international players in the European Union market, because very clearly there are. Um, so I think it's not surprising that um, there is a reconsideration of the goals. I, I see and respect and, and understand the union's priorities. Clearly, it will put us in tension in some areas because the union's goal is to, um, uh, I hope I'm not um, misconstruing in a way that's offensive, but to, um, to enhance control of the strength of the currency and economic autonomy by having more control of the union's own financial system. And given the degree of integration between our two markets and the extent to which um, business is distributed between the two markets, that does put us in tension in some areas. I think um, we will need to keep lines of communication open and clear on that as we understand how the union intends to pursue this agenda and it becomes a bit clearer. Um, it's worth observing having you know, talked quite a lot about the MOU that we're talking to the European Commission about, that there are already um, supervisory memoranda of understanding between the UK supervisors and all their European counterparts, that they work very closely together, literally on a day to day basis, that they know each other very well, um, and that that will be really important as we understand the way these um, policy priorities and agendas intersect with each other in the coming years. Thank you very much, Catherine. I think, Daniel, I'll pass back over to you. I think those were yeah, my yeah, questions. Thank you so much, Catherine. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine. So, so um, I've got one here from Carol uh, Liu. Um, Catherine, please could you elaborate further on the MIFID quick fix type measures that the UK um, would or has done um, in terms of pursuing? Uh, I'm really sorry that I can't do that in tremendous detail because I haven't got the list of them in front of me. Um, <laughs> so I'm very sorry. Um, I can okay. share that. I I can share that after the meeting, but we have, I mean, our intention is, so we looked at the, essentially, yeah. we looked at the, the quick fix package. It looks very sensible. We've looked, we've, uh, and the FCA have looked at how we might achieve similar things where they're relevant mm -hmm. in the UK. And, and that is our intention. I'm sorry, I can't give you more detail. I just don't happen to have the right note to hand to do that reliably. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, there's, a, there's a question on digital financial services. The, the UK uh, CMA has been ahead of the EU. Um, uh, DG, DG FISMA is following its own digital finance agenda. Do you think it'd be difficult to avoid disruption due to differences in standards when it comes to borderless digital services? I think that's a really interesting question. And um, I think this is a challenge, not just with respect to our relationship with the European Union, but frankly, it's the, it's the challenge that um, digitization presents to a system that operates on the basis of a sort of grammar of national jurisdictions, or in the case of the European Union, supranational jurisdictions, but, it, but operate in quite a clear way with the border. Because the very purpose of these technologies is to behave as though such borders don't exist. So we have these discussions in the international standard setters, um, and uh, I think this will be a very live area of policy um, in coming years as we as we tr 
seek to improve our understanding of how to get our hands around both the risk and the opportunities of these technologies. Um, the, the further observation is that I think a lot of the innovation that has been seen in these areas has occurred outside the Anglo-Saxon universe, outside mm -hmm. the European sphere of influence. You know, it's our Asian counterparts who can tell us how these technologies are used, what they release, how consumers respond to them, their efficiencies, their risks. And um, uh, I think it's really important that we continue to have close dialogue with, with those jurisdictions where, frankly, in terms of some of their learning, they're a bit ahead of us, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the, 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 there's a question which um, I, I'm fairly sure I think I know how you answer, but but I'll ask it from Robert Meller. Um, if, if the EU does not move forward on equivalence, how should the UK respond? <clears throat> I don't think there's a question of responding because I think what what we will do, what we our our task now, is to manage our own um, regulatory standards, uh, our own if you like, system, our own constitutional arrangements and our policy programme yeah. to support our economic objectives. And so I don't think we will see a kind of, you know, I don't think our policy will be driven by EU responses or decisions around equivalence. Yeah. I think I think what l potentially lies underneath that is it is certainly true that the longer we go on without substantial equ equivalence decisions in place, the more industry move on, industry adjust restructure, reorganize, and they become less material. And so, um, you know, I think it, I, th I think that as much as anything, and that's been the case actually throughout, it's, it's, it's not, um, it's not people like me, it's not policymakers, it's not legislators, it's not regulators who decide where business is transacted, it's business. And they do that um, in advance of policy outcomes, if it's clear that it, they're going to have to wait too long for their own operational, their own operational purposes. Do, do, do you think that there's an issue with, if I think of that adjustment, and I, and I, I think of the large financial institutions I've worked at, um, they're going to be able to cope with the complexity and the, the adjustment. Mm. But as you go down the spectrum to smaller participants, that they're, they're just going to make choices about pulling out of this. And do, do, do you think it's disproportionate, the, the impact that it's going to have? I certainly think that um, very large institutions can absorb more of the um, the frictional cost of the introduction of borders than smaller institutions. That's what we've been told by industry throughout this throughout this process. I think I think therefore you probably will see. Um, well, I mean, we we are seeing a kind of to some extent a bifurcation between EU and rest of the world as far as the way people think about business they conduct in the UK and um, it may certainly have an effect on the um, on the cost drivers for smaller firms I think that's true yeah. There's a few, few more here is there anything that you could share uh, in terms of next steps on the Treasury's payment landscape for you? Um, no, because we're going through the we're going through the um, consultation responses currently. So we have a lot of moving parts in this territory, um, because we have the crypto assets review, payments landscape, Ron Khalifa's work on fintech, mm -hmm. and um, we uh, clearly have to draw all this work together into a kind of coherent. It's 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 really complex, and it will be mm -hmm. complex, mm -hmm. however sort of strategically consistent it is. But we need to draw these things together and work out. Um, you know the the ordering of the issues that we need to address. I think um, payments. The reason we focused on payments is it's the area where to go back to the conversation about digital. We've seen the most, arguably, the most vibrant reform, um, and I don't think. I don't see that mm. slowing down, in fact. And if and with the discussion now about central bank digital currencies, I think we can see that payments is going to continue to be an incredibly active part of the mm. technology debate for some years to come. Mm -hmm. Okay. I've got I've got another payments question, very, very unrelated, and I think I know what your answer will be, but um it, it, the it's about the um mentioning on the um French uh, regulators website of the UK firms that have been prohibited on the e-money and payments uh, companies mm. from doing business um, and uh, the, the question is how much is uh, how much assistance should uh, this regulator get from the UK 
for possible enforcement against these companies in case they breach these prohibitions. I mean, that's it would, it would be wrong for me to speak for the supervisors here, but I think mm. certainly um, our intention would be always that the UK's regulators cooperate effectively with their international counterparts to manage risk um, yeah. and, uh, and to manage uh, risk of all kinds where they see it arising. Yeah. And we would expect that to continue to be the case. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure um, the head of enforcement at the FCA would uh, endorse that. Um, I've got a question on um, uh, on Switzerland. Uh, the UK Swiss regulatory dialogue um, has been frozen uh, because of lack of progress in the wider political relationship. Do you fear any risk of politicalization in the future if a similar regulatory dialogue is established through an MOU? Sorry, um, could you ask that question again? Yeah, sorry. The UK Swiss dialogue. EU Swiss dialogue. Oh, the EU has been Swiss frozen. dialogue. Yeah. So, so, I, so I, do I, we I, see I, the same risk for us with the EU? I, I think so. I, I think it's the, yeah. the, the the second order condition. Uh, yeah. Implications. Well, we would. I mean, we would very much hope not to. One of the things we secured in the TCA was was agreement that there would not be um, cross retaliation for financial services from other parts of the agreement, which I think is quite important to protect um, the way we talk and think about financial services from politicization which i think is very dangerous for for um stability and confidence in the system um the extent to which we're able to maintain a kind of um adult technical regulatory dialogue that is free from politi politicization remains to be seen but that would certainly be our goal because i think it is much better for the system if we can achieve that it conceivably sounds naive but i think you have to um, I think you have to go into it with with um, the right focus and values in order to um, to prevent the the new system that we're trying to put in place being um, being sort of undermined in the eyes of stakeholders. So that's our goal. Yeah. OK. Um, question from David Cook. Do you see the future relationship between the UK and the EU being further localization requirements, particularly around non-personal data and outsourcing? Hello, David. Nice to hear from you. Um, uh, well, I mean, I would hope not. I think the free flow of data, not just with the European Union, but um, more broadly, is absolutely critical to effective management of risk in financial services, as well as to efficiency in their provision. So we continue to make um, pressure against data localization a part of our engagement with all our international partners, um, we think it's uh, really important. So um, from our perspective, I would really hope not to see that. Um, and, uh, you know, we are, all developed economies and indeed emerging economies are data enabled economies. So if you uh, if you go down a road of localization, you go down a road of limiting effectively, limiting productivity, but also risk management. I think, I think we have to continue to be very clear about that. Um, you mentioned earlier um, the US and Japan as countries where the UK has successful regulatory dialogues in place. What are the UK other priority growth markets in financial services to build links? So I think, as I already mentioned, Switzerland, where I think arguably we, we are now in the most developed kind of engagement about um, the relationship between the two jurisdictions um, and where we are um, being sort of most creative and ambitious. Um, we have um, a very important dialogue with India. Um, we uh, also engage closely with Singapore. And as I said, you know, we spent a lot of time last year in, on putting in place uh, trading arrangements with Singapore as we left the European Union. Um, and we continue to work very closely with Chinese authorities um, to ensure that we are engaging to, to be a partner in the liberalization of their financial system. Um, and, and then Brazil, where we also continue to build relationships and, and seek to find ways to make ourselves relevant to their economic goals. Um, so it's actually, I mean, it's pretty broad. I haven't, you know, if we had a, if I had a DIT colleague on this call, they would also, I'm sure, want to talk about CPTPP and the multilateral, mm -hmm. multilateral fora because they're really important too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question about, this time it's about AFMD and the USITS reviews. Are HM Treasury worried about potential changes to portfolio delegation 
as part of the EU's ongoing reviews? Uh, and if so, are um, the Treasury engaging with EU parties to ensure any potential changes don't harm the UK asset management industry? Well, I'm. Um, uh, it's very cheering to hear that you think we would have that degree of influence over European <laughs> Commission policy goals. But um, uh, so uh, portfolio delegation is is a very important principle for the operation of the international financial system. It enables uh, fund management most effectively to support businesses, but also individual savers. And that's important, you know, from a finance ministry perspective. Um, the savings for individuals and households and particularly for later life are just absolutely critically important as part of our um, economic concerns. So I think the I think its importance is clear. I think the value of portfolio delegation is clear. I think we have been very publicly clear about our position on that and very vocal about it and the importance of preserving that. Um, the extent to which um, that you know for the, the the balance that the Commission strikes uh, between that and its its other policy goals is for the European Commission, um, but it seems to me that to do anything other than support those norms is ultimately is harmful for you know not for businesses, not for economies, for people, and that's what we have to keep um, in the front of our mind. So we will continue to be advocates for that. But I have to be, you know, quite honest about the extent to which we're currently seen to be incredibly influential over European Union policy for good reason. I think they feel it's time that they um, started to think about it slightly differently. Yeah, um, the, 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 this is um, there's a question coming totally unrelated to the EU. Um, and that's around the main takeaways uh, around Reddit uh, event in the sector. So oh, yes. Game, stock shares, etc. on the functioning of financial markets. So, so, so the question acknowledges it's probably an issue for the SCA, but the one. Yeah, it is. It. it is. And I shouldn't stray into it too far. I mean, I, I found it, I mean, just personally, I found it an incredibly uh, sort of interesting set of incidents. And I think it is, I think what was interesting for me was the kind of, I mean, we were talking about politicisation. This was, this was sort of retail trading with a political agenda, which was quite mm. interesting from a policy mm. perspective. But from a kind of system perspective, you know, an asset price bubble is an asset price bubble and yeah. retail investors losing money is retail investors losing money. And that's the sort of thing yeah. that we have to worry about um, because um, people taking risk that they don't fully understand is bad for the system and it's bad for confidence in the system. Um, but I mean, really, really interesting. And I'll be interesting. It, it'll be interesting to see the kind of aftermath of that of that experience and incident. Yeah. Yeah. So slightly related to this, um, how do we strike the right balance between building effective regulatory regimes tailored for the UK market and creating compliance burdens costs for cross-border firms? Mm. For example, um, could the UK bring in an improved investor disclosure regime where PRIPS has created challenges? But uh, this could mean firms producing additional disclosure documents when marketing in the EU, uh, from the EU into the UK, for example. So I think this is it's a really good question and it's right on the money in insofar as it exposes the core question um, when people get excited about regulatory reform in the UK post-EU mm. membership. Because there is a lot of excitement about all the things we now could do. But um, I think that doesn't it doesn't always fully recognise the sunk cost involved in already complying with a load of requirements. And it definitely doesn't reflect the fact that um, we could do all sorts of things to change our own regulatory regime. But mm -hmm. for firms who still have to comply with regimes everywhere else, actually, the benefit may not be material. And I think um, it will be so important for us and for our regulators as we manage our um, regulatory standards moving forward to really understand the difference between what is possible and what is materially beneficial. Um, because otherwise we could generate an enormous number of consultation papers, mm -hmm. which would make us feel tremendously productive and very dynamic mm -hmm. and creative. But actually you're not generating much in terms of improved efficiency of the regulatory system. So it's for, it's critical that the industry helps us understand what is useful in terms of adjusting the way we run regulation. And I think it's just, I mean, I, I referenced this at the beginning, I think it's just really important to reiterate that, um, you know, 
all of this is within the context of ensuring a system that is stable and works for UK citizens and its economy. I mean, the UK taxpayer is still paying for the fact that we didn't have our current regulatory regime in the run up yeah. to the financial crisis. So, yeah. you know, it is part of the kind of social contract that the the, the the externalities are not again felt in that way by taxpayers and that's always top of mind for us yeah one one last question then i'll ask a final one and i think um you, you've been great in terms of um time and the variety of questions you've answered <laughs> um and, and th this one is just um uh envisaged overhaul of the regulatory framework for small banks so it's really about proportionality yeah um and you know what what the the treasury are doing in that regard so, I mean, proportionality is more, um, uh, so, I mean, we're in favour of proportionality, clearly, who yeah. isn't? Um, but I think in terms of the way, I mean, what it means is you size the regulatory focus and burden to the regulatory risk presented by the firm. And that's something that the regulators judge. Um, and, you know, I know from my experience when I was a regulator, you know, we thought about it a lot, although not as much, I think, as our regulated population wanted us to. Um, I think Sam, the way Sam Woods is thinking about this um, is really interesting. He's given a number of really interesting speeches about this and the question about how we can make regulation for, you know, the smaller, the tiers of smaller banks, um, no less effective, but optimised in terms of, you know, resource spent is going to be really interesting and um, is something that we, to some extent, can do because we've left the European Union because um, we have more control over the requirements in CRR. Um, now, uh, you know, my European colleagues, when we had, when we were members of the European Union and we talked about this, my European Union colleagues would point out that you can get plenty of risk in mid and small tier firms um, and you aggregate that risk and you still have a stability issue but I think it's um, it's certainly a really fruitful area for the regulators to be exploring and very coherent with the way the government's thinking about um, how we manage our regulatory environment and our broader public policy environment from now on. So, so last question for a minute it kind of builds on Catherine some of the what you've just said and that's you know for 50 odd years you've had you've had people from the treasury go to to brussels talk about financial services you've had you've had in various guises people from the the fca fsa pra where you worked before um have the same dialogue through, through, through again various institutions that's gone um to the same degree how are we going to get that back because yes they're frustrating times but the the, the collective benefit of that dialogue um, over the years is, is to both, you know, both gain in, in many yeah. cases. How, how are you going to get some of that dialogue back? Um, look, I mean, there's no there's no way around the fact this relationship has taken a battering in the last few years and we need to rebuild it. We need to rebuild trust and understanding between us um, because the fact of our leaving has changed policy objectives or at least um, the policy context mm. on both sides. Um, I think that, um, you know, our, our, we used to have a very effective UK representation to the European Union that has that has transformed into a very effective UK mission to the European Union. Mm. Um, my colleagues there, you know, we're still in very close touch with our colleagues there. And I th think our, our job uh, on the UK side is to be clear about what we're about, to do the things mm. we say we're going to do. There's a lot of noise around what the UK's regulatory agenda should or could be. And I think we need to demonstrate that what we say we're going to do is then what we do. I think we need to, where there are areas of shared interest, genuinely collaborate um and my hope is that through doing that we will rebuild constructive engagement and i see no reason why we wouldn't be able to do that mm -hmm. thank you okay well i re really appreciate um you taking the time i know I, I, just, I know how busy you are um and you you've been incredibly fantastic at answering all these uh, the questions so um apart from mifid quick fix i feel terrible about that i'm so sorry i think it was carol who asked that question I'll, now I'll, i'm I'll, mortified I'll, i couldn't I'll, come I'll, up with the answer and my team will be furious so um <laughs> i will daniel i'm going to share something with you so you can share it with right. attendees just to demonstrate that we know the answer even if i don't have it at my fingertips <laughs> thank you great <laughs> okay email to come carol thank you so much, <laughs> okay absolute pleasure and lovely to see so many friends on the yeah. call take care bye-bye okay. thank you